Okay, <clears throat> so it's 10 a.m. now, so we'll begin. Hopefully, um, everyone else receives the link soon. Sorry about that. It I thought I'd sent it on Friday, but it turns out it only went to the host and not the actual attendees. So a little bit of a mistake, but hopefully they join soon. Um, so to begin, I just would like to welcome everyone to our event. This is our first uh, virtual event for high school students. So we hope um, it goes well other than that snag this morning. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that McMaster University and the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. So today you'll be hearing from a few of us staff members at the CCM. I'm Sam Stambula. I'm the Outreach Coordinator. So I'm the person who runs these types of events um, for our users and just for the general public. Uh, we also have Natalie Hamada joining us and I'll, you'll get, um, yeah, no, thanks Natalie. If everyone just wants to give a wave, we'll have uh, better intros when it's their section. I just want to stay on schedule because we are uh, pretty jam packed today. So Natalie is helping us out today with the questions and answers. So you're going to be putting your questions directed to Natalie um, or to myself, but preferably Natalie in the chat session. So anytime you have a question, just put it in the chat to Natalie and then she's going to ask those at the end of each uh, presentation. And if we don't have a chance to get to all the questions, we're all all the staff members are going to take a little bit of time at the end of the presentation today uh, just to actually um, answer those questions for you and I'll send it off um, in an email to your teachers and then they can distribute it from there. Um, Natalie runs our one of our or a few of our TEMs. You can see one behind her actually. Um, she's in the lab today. <laughs> we also have Marcia Reed. Uh, she works at CCEM in the Faculty of Health Sciences. So she runs a lot of biological samples, and that's what her presentation will be focusing on today uh, with the transmission electron microscopes and the scanning electron microscopes. Next, we have Carmen. Carmen is another TEM or transmission electron microscopy operator here at the center. And you can see the Talos 200 located behind her. And that's um, the instrument she'll be showcasing today. And then we have Joyner Martinez. He's one of our scanning electron micros microscope experts. Um, so he'll, he'll have a video on mask materials for us today and be answering questions. Um, just so you know, this is being recorded. So I'll send along the final recording also. So if you guys want to review anything, um, that's also possible at a later date and we'll, we'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel too. So to begin, I'm going to give a little intro just into why we even care about electron microscopy, what we do with it, how it works, and then we'll get into the actual instrumentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so you can see here, um, this is our intro, we're just called looking into the atomic world. So why we might want to be doing this and what kind of information can we get with these electron microscopes. So first we need to ask the question, why do we even care about electron microscopy, what can we learn from it. So with the eye, um, that's our first tool to examine materials, uh, but we are limited with what we can see. And that gets down to around um, a little less than the millimeter range. Next, we have light microscopes, and you even may have used some of these um, in your courses or in your classes in high school. And things we can look at with that are the human hair, a red blood cells, maybe even starting to see bacterium. And that gets us down into this micrometer range. So that's 10 to the minus six of a meter. Um, but it, we are limited with the light microscope and I'm gonna go into why that is in the next slide. So if we wanna look at anything smaller um, than the micrometer, we need to move on to something other than light. And that's like the light around us that we use in the light microscopes. And that's why we started using electrons. 
So electrons really allow us to reach down to that single atom stage. So we can start looking at viruses, DNA, molecules, and atoms. And that's how we're able to understand how materials are actually structured and put together. So how those atoms are arranged, what atoms are present, and we can start to understand why that arrangement and the specific atoms matter and the properties that we can get from that. And that allows us to engineer new materials. So why are electrons special? What actually allows us to get down and look at those atoms? So we have our light microscopes, what we discussed. So we have different, um, different wavelengths that we can look at. And in the light wavelength, uh, we know that this, the lowest, sorry, the lowest resolution we can go is 40 nanometers. And that's in this purple range here. And that's really pushing our microscopes. That's, and that's the theoretical limit. Now the issue is um, with the glass lenses, we can still have some distortions due to how they're manufactured. So it doesn't actually allow us to get down to that pure 400 nanometer resolution. And so if we wanna see anything smaller than that based on our light spectrum range, we need to move to the electrons. And that's because electrons are special. Um, they can behave both as particles and waves. And this may be something you've discussed, um, it may not. It's just something that's inherent to electrons and it's called the particle wave duality theorem. So they can either be a little particle shooting at your sample or a wave like the light that we see here. And we can use that to our advantage. So by applying energy, uh, giving these electrons energy, we can actually control that wavelength. So the wavelength is how big, um, how big and the resolution that we can look at with the electrons. So the more energy we give them, the smaller that wavelength is. And that's what actually allows us to look down at the single atoms because we can start to resolve things that are below um, an angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. So that's what makes these electrons special. And that's why we use them um, to see beyond what we can see in the light microscope. <clears throat> so why do we even care about what we're looking at at the atomic scale. So I have this little guy here. This is our gecko. He's pretty cool. Uh, gecko feet actually got me interested in nanotech engineering and uh, looking down at the atomic scale because without looking at the atomic scale, it's you can't know why the geckos can stick to things. And gecko feet are really cool. They're really sticky. It allows them to climb up all different materials. Um, but we don't know why just by looking at this picture here and examining with our eye. So if we look a little closer, we can see they have these little ridges on their feet. Again, those are too big to explain why they're able to stick to so many surfaces. So if we look even closer, so this is still what we can see with our eye. Now, if we look a little closer with the light microscope, these are those little ridges. And it's at this stage, you can start to see something really cool. So other than being, them being really sticky, they're also super hydrophobic. So if you drop a water on this foot pad, it balls up and it won't wet the surface. Again, at this stage, we can't really see anything special as to these ridges and why these gecko feet are allowing us to do that. So um, we can't see that with the light microscope. So we need to move to the electron microscopes to actually see what's happening. So if we look a little closer now, we can start to see something interesting happen. Down in these ridges, we have these long hairs and we can't see these without the electron microscopes. And if we look even closer at the tip of those hairs, we have more hairs. So this gecko foot has millions of these little hairs that can create these van der Waal forces with whatever it's sticking to. And that's what allows it um, to actually stick to all these different surfaces. But without looking down at this nanoscale and seeing all these little hair-like structures, we wouldn't know that. And that's what's interesting is we can use these electron microscopes to understand either why things are happening the way they are, um, and then try to engineer those into materials that we need today. And that's called biomimetic um, science, where we can take things inspired by biology and try to engineer them into something that we can create. And this is one example of that is with this gecko foot. So uh, we can look now at the electron microscopes 
And there's actually different types of electron microscopes. And I kind of mentioned that when I was introducing uh, the different speakers. So today we're gonna look at scanning electron microscopes. So that allows us to see from this 10 micrometer uh, down to maximum around five nanometers. And that's really pushing this instrument. Next, we have the transmission electron microscope. And that's what allows us to get down to the atomic scale. So depending on what type of information we need, whether we want to stop at that gecko foot and just look at those hairs, or maybe we really want to see what atoms are at the tip of those hairs, um, then we would move into this transmission electron microscope range. And it's simply just due to how the signals are detected um, with the two different instruments. And that's what would um, tell you which instrument you need to use. So let's get into a little bit of why we have these different resolutions with the instruments. So with the SEM or the scanning electron microscope, our electrons are going to come down that we've produced at the top of our column. They're going to hit our sample and then we get all these signals in green, red, blue, and purple that can come off and they come off the top of our sample. So we have different detectors that can detect all those signals. So they're going to tell us what elements are present, where they're located in our sample, and what the topography of our sample looks like. So like we saw in those gecko foot images. Then if we look at the transmission electron microscope, we have even more signals we can look at now. So as the name suggests, transmission, the electrons are going to come down, they're interacting with our sample, and then they're actually going to go through our sample. Um, and those are the electrons we're detecting. So we're detecting these ones that come directly through and then other scattered electrons as well. So what we can see with the TEM is because we have that higher resolution, we can see how the atoms are arranged, what patterns they form, the type of atoms that are present and how they're even bonded to each other. So if we have a single or a double bond, um, we can actually determine that with our transmission electron microscopes. Um, so that's what we're going to show you guys today. We're going to focus on one. First, we're going to show you the scanning electron microscope. So that's going to be with Joiner looking at mask materials. Next, we're going to look at the transmission electron microscopes looking at different pigments that you might see in paints um, on cars or in your walls. And then with Marcia, we're going to look at biological uh, biological material and we'll see the what the SEM and the TEM can do um, when you want to use it as a holistic method to look at uh, different resolution scales. Um, so with that, Natalie, has any questions come in? Uh, no, not yet, but I'm sure they will have when uh, we start watching these videos. OK, so with that, if there's no questions, if anyone has a question, feel free to throw it in. I am going to stop sharing and I will load up the first video for us. So this first video is from Joiner. Joiner, you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope you can all hear me okay. And I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, thank you. Natalie, let me know if there is an issue when I hit play. Otherwise, I will assume everything's OK. Hi, everybody. My name is Jordan Martinez. I'm an SEM technician here and a sample preparation specialist at the CCM. I hope you're all having a good day. And we're just here about to explain why um, we want to use the SEM. And in this case, I've chosen masks to use as an example, because I think the times is right, OK? Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about is sample preparation. I want to show you guys how to prepare a sample for SEM, what are certain things that we have to look out when preparing samples for SEM, and then I'm going to show you the different parts of the SEM, how the SEM comes together to get the pictures that we like, 
and then explaining a couple of detectors and doing a demo live, you'll get to see how it all comes together. I have here three different um, samples. And as I mentioned earlier, they're masks. And I have here, the dark one here is a fiber mask. So it's 100% cotton. And then I have here a standard level one mask. And then I have a N95. What I want to show uh, about these three is I want to show the difference in the fiber linings that they have, you know, the arrangement of every fiber. In the N95 here, I want to show the three different levels of protection that it has. It has an inner liner in between um, these two layers of fabrics. And then here in the standard level one, I want to show the welding areas where they come together in a sort of a mesh. And then you have these sort of welding areas that are are the separation lines between how the fibers come together, okay? What I've added here is that at every corner, right, the nickel paint, usually when you have a cross section like an N95 and it goes up a little too high, you wanna go a little bit to the edge with the nickel paint. It's really important because like I said, these are all polymer masks, they're cotton masks, they're not conductive, right? So we need to make sure that we have conductive properties and to further help this sample, we're going to coat it. I have here a finished product. I'm going to show you a little bit of coating after, but you can see the finished product here, gold coated. You can see the nice yellow tinge to it. And you can see the different nickel paint areas as well. And then you can actually see the welded areas come a little bit highlighted um, due to the gold coating. Our sample is now sitting in our vacuum. We needed to wait at least 20 minutes to let the nickel paint dry to make sure that we're not um, spending too much time pumping the, the sample under vacuum. I'm going to add a pressure. Okay, I have, a, I have an arrow pointing here on my pressure valve, letting me know where I need to, to be in order to have a good coating. Okay, I'm going to activate my timer. I'm going to activate my high tension. And I'm going to cook. So what's happening here is we have argon flowing through the, through the vacuum, through the chamber here. And it's reacting with the gold particles, creating this glow. This is the Joel 6610 LV. This is an SEM that allows us to go to a resolution of about 300 nanometers. Um, it has an energy range of about uh, 30 kV, from 1 to 30 kV. If we come a little closer, we'll be able to see here on the left side our EDS detector. The EDS detector has a 20 millimeter squared window, which allows us to do elemental analysis. So we're able to see and we're able to tell live what the sample is made out of um, in terms of different elements from the periodic table. Down here, we have a fully, um, a full automatic mechanical stage, which allows us to move the sample to different working distances. By working distances, I mean focus points, where we're able to do a lot more analysis and get a lot more resolution the closer we move to the pull piece. The pull piece is this piece up here. That's where the electrons come down from. This is where the electrons are also collected through. In the back of this pole piece, we have our secondary detector, which allows us to pick up the secondary X-rays or the secondary um, electrons. And then we have underneath the pole piece, which it looks, sort of looks like a glass slide, is our backscatter detector. The backscatter detector allows us to see background differences in contrast, and samples that have a heavier atomic number will actually look brighter under backscatter. So we're able to tell compositional difference and topographical difference with the backscatter here on this SEM. In terms of SEM, various SEMs have different sizes that you can put in the chamber. In this case, for the 6610, we're lucky that we have a variety of holders to work with. The biggest samples that you can put in the SEM will probably be the size of my hand here. And as long as you can probably double side tape on, on top of the holder, you can also work around with different holders here to sort of accommodate for whatever application you need. In this case, I'm going to be putting a stub. So I'm just going to be putting the sample down like that. Okay. 
So this is sort of how it fits all together. Okay. We need to measure the height of this sample as well. In some microscopes, is required to know the height difference between the, the holder and the highest point on the, on the, on the sample. going to place the vacuum or the SEM under vacuum. This is how you start your SEM. So right now, I just want to do some coarse focusing. I'm going to press my ACB, Auto Contrast Brightness button. And we can start to see already some of our mass. So I'm going to find a particle that stands out, so it has a, a shape to it that I can do my alignments in. You can move using your mouse, or you can use um, the stage side of your handset, okay, with the joystick. I'm going to center the sample, do some focusing. Find focus now, get some better details, some stigmation. Okay. After you do your alignments, I'm going to grab a picture quickly. Now the, the nice thing that I wanted to show about these masks is the fact that you can actually see the particles that actually are getting caught by our mask, right? Making, giving us this extra layer of protection that we need for these crazy times out here, okay? This is the N95 mask that we were looking at and the actual fiber diameters range between 10 microns to about 20 microns in diameter, okay? So we're gonna move on to the standard level one mask. Actually, this is our fiber one, but this is also a really, really nice one to look at. You can see the arrangement of the fibers, and you can see that there is actually not a lot of uniformity to the way these fibers are laid out, okay? So it's really important to, to note these differences as you're looking in the SCM, okay? And you can see these fibers that have no shape, they're sort of elongated, they're sort of all over the place, okay? That's the first difference that we're able to note between these two masks here. Okay, and last but not least, we have our standard level one. And the first thing that we can actually see, it's these welded areas that I was talking about, right? So we have here where they all come together, and you can see the spacing here between these guys is a lot more, it's a lot more uniform. Okay, the diameter of these fibers here are a lot larger than, than the N95. As you can see by the scale bar, these ones range between um, probably 50, 50 microns or so, the size of these fibers. But again, hopefully we can see some, oh, there you go, there's some particle. There's a particle here, so we're going to go there. You can see some particles that get stuck there. Now, in, this, in the fiber one, the 100% cotton, we weren't able to see these fibers very well. But again, that has to do with the shape. Sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between what the fiber is and maybe a particle. In this case, because the fibers are perfectly um, in a tube, stranded, you know, uh, we can actually see when they get embedded in these, in these tiny little um, tubes. We're gonna be comparing different um, sizes of the mass in different pictures, just so that we can see a little bit more details on why um, the shape and the arrangement of these masks is so, is so important, okay? So they're, they're all at a thousand times, okay? 10 microns, so you can see some of the fibers here on the N95 are about one micron in size and ranging between one and 10 microns in size. And then we have here the the standard level one, which, which looks like the fibers are about twice the size of, of our scale bar here, so about 20 microns. And then we have our 
are sort of 100% cotton here that is sort of the same size as the standard level one. But again, you can see the roughness of the shaping here. Um, there is no trappedness of particles, as you can see, is for evidence. But so I kind of I kind of like these three pictures down here just to compare them, and it shows exactly the purpose that, that we wanted to to elaborate on, right? Which mask is better? Obviously, the medical masks, and and the purpose of them are being illustrated here. The shape, the size, and the spacing of them um, help in the goal of of protecting us from from COVID nineteen. Great, thanks, Joyner. That was an awesome video. Great video. That was an awesome yeah. video. Uh, so there's a question here um, for you. Uh, one so from Nicholas asks, are the electrons in the SDM acting as waves or particles when aimed at the mass samples? That is an excellent question. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, what I can tell you is in the SCM, the electrons are actually coming down as waves or as clouds of particles. Um, and what we do is we can accelerate them with these different voltages and different energies, and we can determine how we want them to penetrate the sample based on this energy. So what happens is we have an interaction volume between those particles or those electrons that are coming down. They get absorbed, some of them. Some of them get protruded out. And as Sam um, showed and illustrated in her presentation, you get from the SEM side, everything that comes from the top, right? So we get to see the secondaries, the X-rays, and other low energies like fast scatters and OJ electrons. So to answer your question, it's sort of a combination of both because if you have a, a, a lot of them, they can be treated as a wave or um, if you have little, you know, little amounts that we can collect, it, you know, which we do with our detectors, in that case, they're particles also, okay? Great. Um, I have a question since we're a little bit early. But a question that perhaps maybe others might have is, if you didn't, um, if you didn't add the nickel paint onto your mask, what would happen to the sample? That is, that is an excellent question, Natalie. Thank you. And it's great to elaborate on on charging, right? Because, you know, we these electrons have you know negative and positive you know energies to them, and those energies we can we cannot let them collect on the surface of the sample. So what we do is by adding these conductive, you know, paths, so the coating in the video in this case, and the nickel paint, is we want those electrons to have a path to go somewhere. What happens if they collect on the surface of our sample is they start to disrupt the other ones that are coming down. So it, it becomes really problematic in terms of focusing, in terms of trying to, to get our image operations to be correct, right? When you're looking into the SCM, you want to make sure that what you're looking at is, is intact. So a big, a big part of that is making sure that the sample doesn't move. If it charges or if it has a, a lot of energy that is being collected on the surface, it will charge, it will, it will dissipate, it will, it will make all sorts of problems for you. So make sure your, your sample is fully conductive before you decide to put it into an SEM. Awesome, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Oh, no, that's all. That's all we have right now. Excellent. I have a question, Joyner. Sure. What has been a, maybe the most interesting thing that you've looked at in the SEM or, or a, a few interesting things maybe that you've looked at? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, the SEM, because, you know, we, we get more advanced as, as we go through with all our methods. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough to be able to look at things like butterfly wings. Those were Those were really interesting to look at. Um, and then I hope to work with Marcia more on her biological stuff because the shapes, the shapes of, of some biological samples are, are amazing. Um, I was able to look at a, at a piece of candy, which I found very interesting. What I did is because candy, obviously it would melt um, under a vacuum, you know, it won't resist the vacuum or the energies under the SEM. So what, what I did is I gold coated it with a very, very thick layer of gold. Um, and what was happening as I was looking at it was the inside of the of the sample, so the cover of gold, right? I could actually see the cracking begin in the gold um, as I focused the sample. That, that was pretty cool. Um, I think sometime this week I'll be looking at uh, at a couple of samples that that might be pretty cool. Um, so hopefully after I get done with them, I, I can I can have more information on them. So anyone who's interested 
please send me an email. But I, I've taken a look at a various cool samples. I think a, a fly's eye was pretty good. We have some pictures of that, Sam, that we can probably pass around. So those samples like that, they, they always get me interested. Great, thanks, Joyner. No so to stay on schedule, we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is by Carmen. Uh, Carmen, do you want to just say hi? <laughs> yes, sorry. That's okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you are doing okay with the online schooling and um, I wish actually you could have been here and watch us live, not the videos. So um, I hope you are enjoying the next video. Great. Thanks, Carmen. Okay. I'm going to load up the next video. And this is on the transmission electron microscope. So my name is Carmen Andre. I'm one of the operator in the PM operator in the CCM. So today we're gonna look at one of uh, blue pigment sample. So um, this sample is given to us by a company in Toronto, who is uh, using those pigments to make dyes for paints or uh, uh, plastics or inks. And sometimes they are used in food packaging packages as well. Uh, the microscope we're gonna use today is a Talos 200. So the sample we're gonna check today it's a blue pigment. Um, this pigment is used to color um, plastics or uh, it's used in inks or paints. So when it comes to us, it comes in the powder form. If the if the powder is not fine enough, we need actually to crush it to make it really fine. So in this case, it was fine enough. So uh, we can either put it directly on the TM grid, so this is the grid, or um, for us it's easier if, to get a good dispersion if we actually mix it with alcohol or water. So that's what we did. We mix it with uh, alcohol and then we sonicate it to make, to make sure it's actually really um, well mixed and uh, we put one drop of the liquid here on the, the TM grid and the let it dry in here. So once it's dry, we can put a grid on in the holder by using a vacuum tweezer pump. And then we need to secure the sample really well because we don't want to we have the sample inside the microscope, so we have like two hex rings. Okay, and the last one. Okay, this should be good. And then we need to check if it's secure. That looks good. Okay, so we can put it in the microscope. We need to check the O-ring because that keeps actually um, it goes in the vacuum. So we need to make sure everything is clean. If it's not, we can do some air duster. And we can put it in the microscope. So we're gonna put it in the microscope. And it takes about two minutes to pump. So the vacuum is inside is about like 10 minus seven. Um, so um, we achieve this vacuum by using like different stages of uh, vacuum pumps. Uh, because and um, we need the samples to be really clean before we put it in the microscope. So we need to we we need to check really well actually uh, the quality of the samples before we put them in the microscope. Okay, like this one. 
the highlighter. So first we can start by uh, opening the valve, so actually we're going to let the electrons come into the sample. So um, we're going to go to low magnification first, just to have an idea where the sample is on the grid. So what we see right now, it's actually the copper grid. And uh, we have a carbon film which is uh, supported by the copper film. And the sample uh, should sit on the carbon film. Just gonna move around. So, uh, before we do any measurements uh, in the microscope, we need to align the microscope. So. We need to make sure the beam goes on straight on the optical axis of the microscope. So we need to adjust um, um, the magnetic lenses of the microscope in such a way that we are getting the best um, the best resolution um, for this microscope. So um, in TM micro in, in TM mode. Uh, the beam of the, the electrons, uh, which is coming from the electron gun, is uh, focused on to a small, thin beam by the use of one of the lenses of the microscope. Then uh, this beam strikes the thin specimen we have, and then um, parts of it are uh, transmitted depending uh, upon the thickness uh, and the um, electron transparency of the specimen. Uh, the transmitted part is focused uh, by one of uh, objective lenses into an image, and uh, we can see it on the phosphor screen or the um, CCD camera. So um, in the regions where uh, the electrons uh, do not pass through the sample, the image looks dark, uh, where the electrons are um, unscattered, the uh, image is brighter, um, and there are a range of grays in between, depending um, on the way the electrons interact with the uh, with the sample. Um, in a stem, uh, a beam of electrons is actually focused uh, by the electron optics to form a, a small probe. And this small probe is uh, rastered um, across the sample. So if the sample is thin enough, the majority of the electrons are transmitted through the sample. Um, so uh, the image is built up like pixel by pixel. And um, we can um, collect the electrons um, uh, transmitted to the sample at each point uh, in the scanning area. The signal is collected later on by uh, different detectors. So uh, these two images are taken from uh, the same area. So the one on the left is uh, taken in TM mode and the one on the right is taken in the STEM mode. So, uh, uh, in TM mode, uh, we were interested to get information about the uh, particle size and shape of, uh, of those pigments. Uh, we can also get um, the position of the atoms, how they are arranged, and also the space between them. In STEM, we can get uh, more information related to the composition of the particles. So the heavier elements will gonna appear brighter. So um, if you look on the TM image, the darker area means that the sample is thicker in that area. And then um, 
um, the corresponding or stem image shows that um, th there might be some um, elements which are a bit heavier uh, where the bright area are. So guys, next time you pass a blue car or um, you have any room paint in blue, think about those uh, particles and how do they look like. Um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, if you have any questions, you can post them on the Q&A section. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Carmen. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, so there's a couple from, okay, so for one from Christopher, he asked, I guess it's concerning um, the vacuum. So like, does, when you transfer a sample from air to vacuum, does it change? Does it change uh, morphology? Does it look different? What happens to it? Does it disturb it at all? Uh, deep, deep, that that depend, depending on the sample. So we do have samples which are used for batteries, and those samples are uh, air sensitive, and uh, they cannot be exposed to to the air. So what we do with those special samples, we, um, we prepare them directly in a glow box, which is actually uh, not exposed to the air at all. And uh, using a special holder, we can transfer them directly to, to the microscope. So in such way, the sample doesn't have any exposure to the air and then uh, we, uh, the, the structure of the sample is not modified at all. Um, the majority of the samples, um, they don't need any special requirements for the vacuum. So um, we need to know in advance if the sample is beam sensitive or is air sensitive before we put it in the microscope. Great. And uh, another one um, from Nicholas asks, does the TM only study the electrons that pass through the sample? Um, or I guess in other words, what other electrons are being detected in, in the TEM? So if it looks through the sample, what are you collecting, I guess, and all the different signal that you can get from it? So um, in TM, we use the electron which are transmitted to the sample. So that's why the samples has to be really thin. Uh, we do have when the, the electrons are interacting with the sample, we generate uh, different signals like the X-ray signal, and uh, collecting that signal can give us information about the, the particle composition. And also the electrons which are passing through the sample, they are losing signal, so they're losing energy. And um, there is another mode to get the composition of the sample using ELS, electron energy loss spectroscopy, and uh, we can get the composition of the sample as well. All right, great, thanks. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, when you have the sunlight, it's white light, but you hit, it hits you and you see all these other light that's emitted. So it's the same thing with electrons. You can get all these other signals that come off. It's pretty cool. So, uh, okay, another, another question uh, from Aiden. So can electron microscopes only view dead cells and why? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, yes, so normally be, because of the vacuum limitation, we need to have the sample dry or embedded in an epoxy or um, flash frozen. Um, but more recently, there is another branch of uh, microscopy it's called the liquid cell microscopy, which uh, allows us to look at the uh, liquid samples. Uh, we need a special holder for these uh, samples, and um, the sample is actually it's a sandwich between two chips, and um, we we can just put it in the microscope and look to the liquid. It's a bit harder than the, with a dry sample because the, usually it's hard to control the thickness of the samples, but this is the best way to analyze samples which are actually modifying in time or modifying the structure when they get dry and uh, in situ mode we call it in situ 
it's um, the only way we can actually see any modification of the structure. So uh, this field of microscopy is it's used uh, especially for the batteries, and then the, they want they um, they wanted to see how the structure of the batteries of the cell phones, for example, are, is changing uh, in time. Uh, yeah, so um, we do have this option in the CCM. We have two holders which we uh, we can uh, analyze the liquid sample. So. As I said, it's it's a new field, and uh, we are catching up to that. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Maybe we can squeeze in one more question. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, just one quick question. So, um, our our Pinsma asked. Um, I'm going to kind of like modify this question a little bit. Can the radiation from the electron microscopes damage samples? We saw that from Joiner, but um, in the TM especially. Um, how how do you avoid damage from uh, the electron beam for tear samples? Uh, yeah, so especially with biological sample, uh, there are some issues with uh, with the uh, radiation. So uh, to minimize those, we can choose different voltages because the, the TR microscopes are working from uh, sixty kilovolts to three hundred kilovolts. So by using a lower voltage, we can minimize all this. Great. Thanks, Carmen. That was very interesting and, and great questions, everyone. Uh, so next we are going to join Marcia. Um, Marcia, do you want to say hi? Hello. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope that we're providing you with some interesting information. And now you're going to see my video that sort of ties some of this in, in together and it's more biological. Um, I'm hoping that this will encourage you to continue your studies in science and we'll get to see you in person someday coming onto campus. So thank you for coming. Great. Thanks, Marcia. So as Marcia mentioned, uh, we're going to be showing some biological samples. So that'll add on to the, the viewing dead cells or live cells question. And this video really shows how we can use the scanning electron microscopes and transmission electron microscopes to gather different information and different length scales about our samples. Hi everyone, I'm Marcia Reed, and I'm going to give a short presentation on techniques that I use to allow me to look at biological samples in an electron microscope. Different types of biological samples that I work on would include plant and animal tissues and microorganisms like bacteria and viruses. All of these types of samples will use similar preparation methods to what I'm going to show you. For my example today, I'm using the spleen of a mouse, which is the dark red organ that you see, and it's still attached to the pancreas, which is the yellow tissue. The function of the spleen in the body is to filter the blood and to remove old red blood cells, but it also plays a role in fighting off some types of infections. In both mice and humans, the spleen is found on the left side of the abdomen, under your ribs. First thing I do when I get a sample is to dissect it down into smaller pieces, close to one millimeter cubes, and I put it into a fixative to preserve the tissue so that the appearance of the cells doesn't change very much from their natural state. After this, I make several more chemical changes to further preserve the tissue and then slowly remove all the water and replace it with a solvent like ethanol. If I want to look at some of the tissue with a scanning electron microscope to see the surface structure, then at this point I can put some of the tissue pieces into a drying machine called a critical point dryer, which will slowly remove all the solvent from the tissue without collapsing the structure. After drying, I tape the tissue to a stub, coat it with a thin layer of metal like gold, and put it into the chamber of the SEM. Once the air is pumped out of the chamber of the microscope, 
I can turn on the electron beam and look at the surface of my tissue pieces. Here are some images of what I could see. First, you see an image of the outer surface of the capsule of the spleen. This is at 500 times. And then the same surface zoomed in a bit more at 2,000 times. It was interesting to see that the surface wasn't smooth. These other images are all from parts of the inside of the spleen at 400 times for the first one and then 2,000 times magnification showing cells and connected tissue. If I instead wanted to study the internal structure of individual spleen cells with a transmission electron microscope, then I need to do a bit more work to prepare the sample so that I can make a really thin section of the tissue. As is, the tissue is much too soft to be cut as thin as I need it to be to look at in the TEM. So I need to embed the tissue in a resin or plastic so that I can cut the tissue into sections which are about a thousand times thinner than paper. So I start processing the same way I did for, for the SEM, but instead of drying after dehydrating in solvent, I now start adding increasing amounts of resin in a liquid form. After the tissue is in 100% resin, then I can scoop the tissue pieces out of the glass vial and put them into an embedding mold that I fill up with pure resin and put in an oven overnight to harden. The next day I have hard blocks with tissue pieces embedded in the tips of the blocks. For sectioning the tissue, I use an ultramicrotome, which you see here. This has a control box that allows me to control cutting speed and to set sectioning thickness anywhere from several microns and down to about 40 nanometers. To give you an idea of how thin that is, a bacterium is about 1,000 nanometers. So I could cut 25 slices through the bacterium at 40 nanometer thickness. So I take one of the blocks of embedded tissue and I put it into a holder that will fit in the cutting arm of my microtome. Then I put the holder into the arm of my microtome and make sure it is nice and snug. Next, I put my knife holder in place on the microtome and then I insert a knife into the holder. This is an expensive knife with a diamond edge on it that is very sharp for cutting thin sections. Looking through the binoculars, I carefully line up my knife with the sample block that I am going to cut. The diamond knife has a boat or well attached to it that I fill with water trying to get the water level exactly right so that it just wets the edge of the diamond so when the sections float off the sharp diamond edge they float onto the surface of the water as I cut. Every time I turn the wheel on the right side of the microtome the sample advances towards the knife edge by whatever thickness I have set on my control box. As soon as I am close enough that the knife is just starting to cut sections off the block then I can press a button on my control box to turn on automatic sectioning. Then I watch until I think I have some sections that I want to look at. At this moment, I'm cutting sections that are about 600 nanometers thick so that I can have a look at the tissue in a light microscope to make sure the area I am cutting is what I need and that overall quality of the sample looks good. Hopefully, you are able to see some sections floating on the water surface of my knife in this image. I pick up the sections from the water with a wire loop and an eyelash glued on a stick that I use to move the sections into the center of the loop. I move the sections within the loop into some stain called toluidine blue that dyes the tissue in the section to let me see some cellular details when looking at it with a light microscope. After about 30 seconds in the stain, I take the sections out and move them to a couple of water baths to get rid of the excess stain.
and then I put them into one final heated water bath to remove small wrinkles in the sections. And then finally I put the sections onto a glass slide which is then dried on a hot plate. Now I can look at the sections that I just made with a light microscope and I am able to see large structures like nuclei, cell boundaries, and blood vessels. This stained section helps me to pinpoint areas that might be interesting to look at in the transmission electron microscope. So finally, I'm ready to make my thinner sections for the TEM. I changed my knife to a slightly higher quality diamond edge and cut sections that are in the 80 to 100 nanometer range. This time I used the eyelash and a grid, which I'm holding in a set of forceps to place some of the thin sections on. Once the grid is dry, I can put it in the transmission electron microscope. To place my grid in the microscope, I first use a set of forceps to lift up a clamp on the specimen rod. Then I place the grid section side facing up in the depression over the hole on the rod, trying to get it as close to the center as possible. And then I push the clamp down with the forceps. Now the specimen rod is ready to go back into the microscope. I put the rod into the st sample stage or goniometer of the microscope and then I wait for the air to be pumped out which takes about 30 seconds. Then I'm able to turn the rod and fully introduce it into the column of the microscope. Finally I'm ready to turn on the electron beam and look at the sectioned material. I'm able to see different individual cell types and organelles such as nuclei and mitochondria and I can zoom in to interesting features like the little hair-like projections you see here called microvilli that help increase surface area for absorption. So to finish, I just want to say thank you for watching my presentation. I hope I've provided you with some interesting information on how to look at biological samples using electron microscopy, or at least sparked your interest in science in general. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, Marcia. That's really cool. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what, what was that, that thing? What was that last image that you had there? But those were actually lichen that you see growing on the sides of trees. Oh, and, that's awesome. It's like little hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, I'm going to think of little hands now when I see that. Okay. Uh, so Nicholas asks, would COVID-19 particles be studied and observed in the same fashion as the section shown in the video? Um, also, it seems like a very tedious process to analyze biological materials. Uh -huh. That is true. It, it is tedious. Um, I actually work in in the hospital at McMaster, so I'm working with clinical staff as well. So they get um, patient samples all the time, and they are able to go from the morning of today, process the sample, get it in the oven by the end of today. Tomorrow morning they would section it, and in the afternoon they can look at the sample. And yes, you could potentially look at COVID particles the same way. They've been trying to do that um, in muscle tissue and, and lung tissue here. We're not convinced that we can actually see it um, in the tissue itself, but the pictures that you see on television and stuff are isolated particles, so it makes it a little bit easier to see them, and they, they do special techniques so that they can actually see the fine, spiky details on the COVID um, particles. So you, you could potentially use the techniques I showed you to see them, if you're lucky. <laughs> Which then leads me to the next question. I'm sorry, there's no name attached to this one that I can see. Um, but if uh, this question asks, if a step is messed up, uh, do you have to restart the whole process? Uh, 
Um, kind of depends on what step that you missed, but yes, sometimes we do have to start over. So um, we're pretty careful to test all of our uh, chemicals, like the resins. We, ch we check every batch that we make up so that we know that it's going to polymerize properly. But occasionally something goes wrong, like even if it's just too humid of a day and we get a little bit too much moisture in the resin at the end, then it makes it harder to section. And I've had to repeat the odd thing that I've done a big boo-boo on. <laughs> yeah, so it can happen. Mm, interesting. Thanks. I, I have, I guess, one last question if anyone wants to squeeze in their last question. But in the meantime, um, what what are the samples that you get from the hospital? What Oh, so I'm, I don't actually do any of the samples from patients, but what they do get here is tumors, mm -hmm. uh, muscle biopsies, they get blood um, platelets to check the platelets in, in patients. Um, they get hair samples from mostly children. Um, so checking for genetic disorders on the hair samples. They get ciliary brushing, so from the nasal cavities to check the cilia to see if there's any abnormalities there as well. Those are the basic ones, a kidney and kidney biopsies, tons of kidney biopsies. So. Oh yeah, interesting. And I, the same thing, but mostly my stuff is animal related. So for the research purposes, um, so yeah. they're test therapies and trying to come up with better ways to help patients. Okay, great. Uh, we have one other, other question. Um, oh, I guess this other person always to add that are you ever grossed out by anything during your job or are you completely used to those kinds of objects and images? No, I am grossed out all the time. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I the had. The scene was like, wow. <laughs> I had mucus. Uh, samples Ooh. which were disgusting <laughs> uh, that I had to try and dissect into bits. Well, it's mucus; it does not dissect very well. And then just a week ago, I got um, some bat wing, and um, oh. the bone is still in there. So Ooh. crunching a bone <laughs> is like really cringing. So, uh, but okay. it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what has been the most Difficult biomaterial to sample uh, to sample and analyze. Um, there's different things, but I guess the most challenging one was uh, spider silk. So mm -hmm. I was asked to section it long lengthways so that they could actually do chemistry to determine how the bonding is occurring in this uh, spider silk. So trying to see it in resin, which is almost impossible, and then try and section it perfectly along the long axis of it was a challenge, so. Hmm, I can imagine. Great, well, thank you for uh, answering those questions. If anyone has any other questions, please post them in the chat and we'll address them uh, later on in email, I guess. So I'll bring it over to you, Sam. Yeah, great, thanks, Natalie. Thank you, Marcia, that was, that was great. Um, as Natalie mentioned, if you have more questions, feel free um, to ask your teacher and if you want to just forward us those questions then we can get them answered. And again, thank you for joining us in our first high school virtual event. I hope, I hope you enjoyed it and that it, it kept, kept your interest in STEM and we were able to answer maybe some questions that you didn't even know you had uh, before today. Uh, so thank you everyone and have a good rest of the day.